by appearing on podcasts as a guest, you will tap into already established and loyal audiences of your ideal customers instead of building these audiences from scratch, like with launching your own podcast. B3 businesses need to build their own audience of people that know, like, and trust them. When you have your own podcast, you have your own audience. You own that. No one can take it away from you. If you go on someone else's podcast, you're building their audience, not your own. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome, welcome to possibly the biggest podcasting fight or maybe even the biggest fight on LinkedIn of 2023, possibly of the decade. We've got podcast guesting with Jakob Zajicek. Apologies if I got your surname wrong, Jakob. And then we've got podcast hosting with Tom Hunt. Jakob's from Speak On Podcast. Tom Hunt is the CEO over at Fame. Guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to the battle. What are our initial thoughts? What are we feeling, both sides? What are we feeling, Jakob? What are we feeling, Tom? Well, I'm prepared. I'm not sure if Tom is prepared, but I spend a lot of time preparing for this fight. I trained, I practiced, I took my time to prepare my answers. And <laughs> this won't be easy for Tom. This won't be definitely easy for Tom to hold his ground. And I hope that he will actually understand that podcast guessing is the strategy people should follow in 2024. And further, and I will do my best so everyone on this webinar will understand as well. As a fighting intro, Tom, have we got any rebuttal to such? My question for Jakob is, when was the last time you guested on a podcast? Ooh. When is the last time I guested on a podcast? Two months ago. There we go. Straight back, rest straight back in. Straight back in. There we go. And myself, better do a quick intro to myself. My name is Sam Dunning. I will be your host for this fine podcasting battle today. I am a co-owner over at Web Choice, and I host Business Growth Show B two B Marketing Podcast. And just, but uh, just, me- just on that, Sam, you've released like two thousand episodes, right, of your own podcast? Oh, my podcast. Yeah, I think we're on like three hundred forty-eight or three hundred forty-nine oh. episodes, something okay. like that. So, so overshot that by a bit, but that's uh, yeah, an incredible achievement. Your research. How many podcasts have you guested on there? I've guested on quite a lot. Because I'm one of those guys that when it comes to guesting, and this probably isn't in your favor, Tom, most of the time I say yes, but it's not like a straightaway thing. People have to bug me like 10 times unless it's like specific niche to what I want to talk about. But yeah, we'll, uh, I'm not going to be too biased. I'll leave it at that because I don't want to be in Jakob's corner too much. Obviously, I host one, so I'm, I'm 50-50. I'm non-biased either way. <laughs> but your podcast has definitely like helped you out with the business, right? All right you see what he's doing here, Jakob? I don't, I don't like this you early You appeared on 46 uh, podcasts. You appeared on 46 podcasts, and that is a good number. Pretty much the third of, well, one fourth of the podcasts that you produced. So, yeah. Okay. Think, yeah. Well, you are definitely a good referee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm in the middle, guys. Come on. We'll, we'll let Jakob do a very quick intro to himself as well. All right. Very quick intro. I'm Jakob. I'm co-founder and CMO at Speak on Podcasts. And we are booking podcast interviews for founders and executives from the biggest B2B brands such as Gong, Battle. Now we actually finished the campaign for B2B, the vision of Canva. And we've been doing it since 2022. And since then, we've booked more than 2,500 podcast interviews for more than 125 speakers. And today, my goal is to actually make sure that the people joining this webinar will see this strategy superior to podcast hosting. They both have place in the podcasting landscape, but you will decide at the end yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. And over to Mr. Sir Tom Hunt for his intro. Yeah, so we start and grow B2B podcasts for, you can see a few of the names there. I personally hosted, I think, 400, so just a few more than you, Sam, episodes. And full disclosure, I have guested on probably around 30 to 40 as well. So... I have the experience from both sides of the table that I'm going to be sharing openly and honestly today. And I'm sure that everyone here will see that beyond a reasonable doubt, owning your own podcast is the superior strategy. Ooh, more fighting talk. So we've got hosting with Tommy. We've got guesting with Jakob. Today's agenda. So we've got first and foremost, a 90 second pitch from both the contenders. We've got the clash, 10 questions to each. We've got a lightning round where we're going to set up some different scenarios. 
We've got an audience uppercut where I'll actually involve you in the audience. So feel free to throw in your questions in the chat box at any time. If you've got any comments, whether it's fighting talk, whether it's you want to put someone on the spot, I'll pick questions as well as we go to keep things nice and spicy. We've got a knockout pitch where we'll, they'll both be giving a 60 second pitch and then decision time. So make sure at the end, we'll be putting it to you, the audience. So you can decide whether Jakob with the guesting strategy is on podcast or whether Tom with the hosting strategy is going to be the all-time winner of today's Clash of the Titans. So make sure everyone tuning in that you put in your comments, you put in your thoughts, you put in who you think is going to win towards the end. And if there's any questions, I'll try and mix and match as much as I can in the Q&A box. And yeah, feel free to put hashtag hosting or hashtag guesting anytime. So with that, we lead on to the 90-second pitch from each of our contendants. All right, let's dive in. So, 90-second pitch. As of today, there are over 4 million podcasts published on the internet. The podcast space is oversaturated and sending out is more difficult than ever. So much so that a, portion, a big portion of podcasts actually quit after just a few episodes. And it is so frequent that it even has its own name. It's called Podfade. And that's why you should start appearing on podcasts as a guest first. By appearing on podcasts as a guest, aka podcast guesting, hashtag, hashtag guesting, you will tap into already established and loyal audiences of your ideal customers. Instead of building these audiences from scratch, like you would launch, like with launching your own podcast. And instead of investing tons of money and effort into your podcast, artwork, name, strategy, description, editing, preparing episodes, inviting guests, publishing, promoting. All you have to do is accept the invitation, show up and talk. And by doing that, you will build awareness at scale, create tons of content, build relationships with podcast hosts, generate leads and build your thought leadership, which means that you will get all the benefits of hosting your own podcast without the responsibility, effort, and costs. So if you need a podcasting strategy in 2024, don't start another podcast. Become a guest on the shows that your audience already listens to to achieve even more. There we go. Jakob, not holding back. No hunches spared. Fighting talk from the off. I should have timed that, actually. I don't know if that was 90 seconds or not, but future it ones was. we will. <laughs> Bang on the dot, 90 seconds. What are we thinking, audience? In the Q&A box, what are our thoughts there? Was Jakob's 90-second pitch up to scratch? Did it fall short? Has Tom got this in the bag? Or has Jakob started off with a clean swing? Is it a one-punch knockout for team guesting? Let us know in the Q&A chat box. We've had great pitch from Kerry. We've had clapping hands from J. Lloyd 1. Yeah, Jakob's saying guesting, but that's not allowed. Okay. Awesome, Jacob from Tracy. Good stuff. Some positive feedback so far. And yeah, Killer's saying that they're interested in hashtag guesting. Good stuff. So we have heard what Jacob's got to say. But what have we got on the 90 second pitch from uh, Mr. Tom Hunt? Allow me to set the scene. So there's three trends happening in B2B right now that are making it harder and harder for any B2B business to find customers. The first one I like to call the AWS effect. This essentially states that anybody with a laptop and an AWS account can start a SaaS company. That's number one. Number two is that people are, are trusting brands a lot less than businesses. They're trusting people or influencers. So this is the rise of the B2B creator. And then third is that if these ad platforms, Facebook and LinkedIn, have got more complex and advanced with their targeting, more and more people are seeing ads and therefore ignoring ads. And so what the sum of all these trends essentially means that in order for any B2B business to get customers, they need to have an audience of people that knows, likes, and trusts them. One of the best ways to get an audience to know, like, and trust a person within your business is to have your own audio stream of content, e.g. a podcast. And so that's why you should start your own podcast as to why you should do that over being a guest on someone else's podcast is because, as I said, B2B businesses need to build their own audience of people that know, like, and trust them. When you have your own podcast, you have your own audience. You own that. No one can take it away from you. If you go on someone else's podcast, you're building their audience, not your own. There we go. 
What did we think, everyone? What do you think of Tom's 90-second pitch? What are our thoughts? He actually finished just short then. He had about 10 seconds to spare, but that's all he needed, apparently. So what are we thinking so far? Are we thinking Jakob with the guest on podcast? There goes my timer. Or are we thinking with Tom with the host your own podcast? What are our thoughts? Ash is with Tom. Will said Tom nailed it. What's Patrick coming saying? Patrick's saying without host, there's nothing to guest on. Well, I can't argue with it, but I don't want to be too much in favor of it. Point for Jacob from Michael. Agreed with Tom from Chad. HP's with Tom. Michelle's Tom's winning for me. I feel like Jacob, well, it's, it's very close. It's very tight so far. I think you could probably cut attention with a knife from what we've seen so far. This battle. Ello's building your own audience. Well, is that hosting? Is that guesting? I mean, I, I guess you could argue for both sides with that comment. Maria's saying Jacob. Eddie's saying Tom's the man. He might be biased because he works for Tom. Right. The Clash. So next up, we have got some questions. And I believe that you're throwing these to each other, right, guys? This is correct. correct. Jacob, how do you ensure that your client, the person who is becoming a guest on a podcast, is getting the exposure and engagement just by attending someone else's and recording someone else's podcast? So it comes down to a couple of important points. First, obviously, is to choose the right podcast to appear on. So you need to clearly understand who is that ideal customer or ideal listener that you would like to reach. So for example, let's say that you are selling to, that you're selling a CRM software. So you probably want to talk to VPs of sales, you know, some sales directors and so on. So what you need to do is that you need to identify the right podcast to be a guest on. And that's really the first step. You want to have a list of shows that are relevant to your target audience. Once you have that, you actually need to prepare, you know, to appear on that podcast. So you get invited and you need to prepare your talking points, your introductions and your call to actions. It's something that you do once and then you can just rinse and repeat, do it over and over again. And then it's really what's in your control, right? So how you promote the episode so once the episode goes live, what do you do? Where do you promote it? And the good part is that even if you decide not to promote it, unlike with hosting your own podcast, the host will still promote it for you and they will drive traffic to your social media channels and they will help you to drive traffic to your website. And what I like the most and what led to six-figure deals for our customers is they control the one interaction they actually have full control over, which is the relationship and the interaction with the host. So by strategically building the relationship with the host, you will get the engagement and you will see the ROI as well. And of course, like on top of the people reaching out to you and producing the content. So that is my answer for this question. Some big punches. Are we allowed rebuttals or is it pure questions at this stage? We allow. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Tom, any, any thoughts? I've heard a big hit or I've heard six-figure deals from podcast exactly guesting. That was, well. that was what I took away from that. Can you tell us more about the six-figure deals? And definitely I can. We had a customer. He, was, he is still providing basically software to fight cybersecurity threats. And he was guesting on cybersecurity podcasts and some business podcasts where he was talking about how to basically be safe online. And then he started networking with the host. He started to ask him questions. And because he built a relationship with the host, the host actually opened up and mentioned that they faced breach recently. And they are searching for a new provider, new vendor. And just like that, they sold their biggest to their biggest account to date. And we have different stories like this as a result of guests building relationships with hosts and basically becoming friends with them to build a no like and trust factor. I can't argue with that. There we go. Can't argue with there's, six figure deals. There's the comeback. But what is Tom going to say to this question from Jakob? So Tom, most podcasts die. How do you prevent that from happening to your clients? Three things. First, most people when they start their own show, they get the positioning of the show wrong. They typically will go too broad and they'll have, maybe they're a B2B company with 50 employees and like $10 million in revenue. And so they have, let's say, $5,000 a month to spend on the podcast and they sell marketing software. They will 
decide to start a podcast just in the marketing space where they're going up against Hubspot or they're going up against Salesforce in terms of like the firepower behind the show. <laughs> it sounds expensive. And so the key, the first key step we state is to get the positioning right, which is two steps. First is to be sufficiently narrow so you can become the number one most added show in that smaller niche within six months. The second is we need to have an edge, which is the thing that our listeners will tell their friends about. And so if we don't have either of those two, if we're too broad and we don't have something that's better or different than our competing shows, then the downloads are not going to go up initially. After three months, you're not going to feel good about the show and then you're going to stop. So step one is getting the positioning right. Step two is just being strategic about guests. The reason for this is because in the first six months of running your own podcast, and I'm happy to share this as a potential downside, I know you can close deal straight away when you're guest on shows, it's unlikely that you're going to generate any revenue from the listener side because the audience is growing. But if you can, say, on a bi-weekly show, build relationships with 12 guests in the first six months, maybe they could be customers, maybe they could be partners. If you have any kind of sales action, you take that to the CFO, show them they are going to be investing in the show for the rest of the year or the rest of the next five years if you show them some potential action through the relationships with the guests. So... Those are the two steps. Get the positioning right, be strategic about guests. If you do that, then the consistency will come because you're going to feel good about the show because it's growing and you're also going to feel good about the show because we've potentially generated some revenue from the guest side. So that is the solution or that is the formula to stop what you mentioned earlier, Jakob, which is pod fade, which is these podcasts that would run for three to six months and then, and then die. Because yes, and I totally admit this is a potential downside, Growing, building your own audience is hard. Obviously, you can choose to just not try to and guest on shows, or you can actually try and do the hard thing, the hard, valuable thing and build the audience, but it does take six months to get it rolling. So I've heard, we've heard a bit of a focus there from Tom. He's gone for the niche. He's gone for the strategic angle with your guests, the way you formalize the show, focusing on those industries that you actually want to be doing business with. What are our thoughts? Let us know in the Q&A box, but more importantly, well, just as importantly, rather, what Jakob's, uh, what's Jakob's rebuttal to that? So to justify running a podcast for six months before you start seeing some traction, do you need to invite potential customers to then pitch them? Or how do you make sure that these relationships that you build to inviting guests on your podcast actually lead somewhere? So just like any relationship, you can't just, and I'm sure you advise your clients this as well when they guest on a show, you can't just record a podcast whether you're the host or the guest and then pitch your guest or host straight after, right? Correct. And so if just like building any relationship, you get to know them, maybe you do something to help them out, potentially they're the way if you're the host of a show, the guest comes on, maybe you formulate the questions in such a way that you may be able to uncover some kind of pain. Maybe you ask those questions after the recording has finished. If you uncover some problem, then either you or a salesperson in your team can then reach out at a later date, typically after the episode has been released, just to be like, hey, heard that episode. Seems like you've got a bit of pain here in this area. Why don't we jump on a call? And I, and I think we could probably help you with that on the call. If you do that, then maybe you get on a sales call and, and they move into the sales process. So I wouldn't say there's no like silver bullet. There's no like email template that's going to turn them into a customer. It's like building the relationship, finding the pain, and then presenting your solution. I cannot argue with that. That's on point. That's something similar we do. We've had two very, very feisty rebuttals that have not been argued with. So we continue with Tom Hunt for a question. What would you say is the average payback period for a guesting campaign? Going off script here. If you just appear on podcasts and you don't do anything else that we recommend, it would take six to 12 months. Which is actually similar to the what I would say is a reasonable ROI payback period for running your own show. Potentially slightly longer. I know because you are tapping in, I'm kind of doing your argument for you here, but <laughs> it does seem like, and maybe you would agree here, Jakob, that if somebody is looking for an ROI faster from the world of B2B podcasting, the guesting could get them there faster. Would you agree? I think it comes down again to the focusing on the relationships that you can control, whether it's you as a host networking with guests or you as a guest networking with host. So you can achieve ROI fastest by focusing on the interactions that you can actually create on your own predictably. I wouldn't necessarily say that one might be faster than another. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Now, let's dig into that then. And we're going completely off script, sorry, Sam. <laughs> but as a 
in an average six to 12 month campaign, how many shows would somebody typically guest on and therefore how many relationships would they develop? Usually we book two podcasts per month. So in six months, it'll be 12 bookings and 24. Uh, in 12, it would be 24. But those are bookings, means that they can be scheduled a little bit more in advance. But on average, we can talk about two bookings per month. And that's kind of similar about the average cadence of a show. So the average number of relationships the host would develop running their own show is bi-weekly. Mm-hmm. And therefore, within six to 12 months of either hosting or gafting, then the individual is going to build 12 to 24 relationships. Right. Masses, right. So that makes total sense. Okay, I mean, it seems like we're kind of at a stalemate on this question. Mm. We, yeah, that's true. We maybe found some common ground after all. Yeah, Ooh. I think we have. <laughs> so there we go. We're finding common ground. We're agreeing on points. The battle is taming. Or is it? <laughs> Jakob with a question. We talked about this a little bit now, but running a podcast is often very hard to measure. So how do you actually demonstrate and maybe quantify the ROI if it's even possible? I love this question. So we break this down into guest side as we've kind of been discussing and then listener side. So let's do guest side first because it's very easy to attribute. Let's say you're running a weekly show, six months. That's going to be, if my math is correct in my head, 24 relationships built. So if the person or the business running the show has like a lower ACV, maybe in the hundreds of dollars because they charge $30 a month for their SaaS tour, then what we're actually doing there out of those 24 is we want a chunk of them to be potential affiliates or partners of the client. Because if we do that, and let's say that affiliate has an email list of 50,000 people, we build a relationship, they maybe get on a demo so we can show them the tool, they become an affiliate, they promote us to their audience of 50,000 people, that's going to bring revenue. And it's very easy to attribute because they're an affiliate that we signed up through the podcast. At the same time, if the client has a higher ACV, then maybe we a chunk of those are going to be ideal customers. And obviously, it's very easy to attribute if a guest becomes a customer because they go into the CRM Hagter's podcast guest. Easy. The actually longer term and more lucrative potential ROI comes from the listener side, though, as I mentioned at the start of this, building the audience of people that know, like, and trust you. So then the question is, how do you track that? How do you know if that impacts uh, revenue? I will admit here, and this is probably a downside for both strategies, that Tracking someone from listening to an episode of for, on Apple Podcasts on their device to coming and becoming a customer is in, nearly impossible. Apple doesn't pass any data through, so you can't pixel people that listen to an episode. But what you can do is ensure that if anybody does come through to your site and signs up via your main CTA, whether that's a demo, proposal, or quest, that we ask them where they're coming from. And so the holy grail is seeing somebody say podcast in that free text field. It's called self-reported attribution. What do we do to increase the chances that, that happens is as the show starts to grow, we like to put in ads for the client's main call to action and then a trackable link in the show notes. So we're going to be able to track by if people click on that link, if ideally a completely separate landing page, so we can obviously track anybody that comes through that. We're going to have self-reported attribution on the main call to action. So if somebody wants to tell us that they came to us from the podcast, then great. But yeah, you are right. There's definitely some value that is lost. And I'll just give a quick example. Let's say we're writing an episode, writing a blog post for every episode, putting that as a blog post on our site. Somebody maybe comes in from Google, finds that article, gets value, and then two weeks later comes to sign up for a demo. Maybe they'll say they heard about that person or that company from the blog, or maybe they just won't say anything. And that's never going to be tracked. Maybe we ask them in the sales process if they where they heard about us, but again, they'll forget that that blog post came from the podcast. So... In summary, those are the two ways we track ROI, but that I do agree there are parts or there definitely is a chunk of ROI potential that is not trackable. Very similar with podcast guesting. It's a combination of something that you can really see that people click the link that was only mentioned during the episodes. But very often it is about asking these qualitative questions, whether it's during the sales conversations or on the form. To give you an example, we have a customer And she said that she doesn't see that people would mention that they came from podcast. But then once she's having the conversation, people joining the calls are warmer. They already know her. And it's a conversation more about how can we work together. And it started happening after she became guest on a lot of podcasts because people did their research before they jumped on a call and they already knew what she wants to talk about. 
and what she stands for and so on. So it was, as a result, much easier sell. But, well, it's difficult to measure like this, right? It's difficult to put in the spreadsheet. So hearing a lot of common ground between <laughs> the two formats. So my takeaway is that it's fairly hard to measure, but you have to really speak to the prospects, whether that's kind of someone that's booked a call or filled out a form on your website. You need to understand how they've heard about you and their route to getting in touch. It sounds like this not necessarily just a click of fingers and you know that you've generated a lead that's then turned into cash in the bank from either guesting or hosting is what I'm getting from this. Pretty much. We continue. Mr. Hunt, will it be a crushing blow? Gifting is nerve-wracking and can expose vulnerabilities and is very unpredictable. How do you prepare your client? It is difficult if you are starting, no matter the preparation, there will be always that feeling of uncertainty, what can actually go wrong? And will I mess up? Will I maybe don't know any answer? But the thing is, it's important to understand how podcast hosts make decisions about inviting someone on their podcast. And they will make decisions based on the information they either receive or they can find online. And then the conversation will evolve around these topics or posts that you wrote and so on. So just By knowing this, I found out that it alleviates some of the stress our customers might feel before the first podcast podcast recording. First, it's usually the most difficult if you've never guessed it on podcast. Second, it's easier. And then from the third and fourth or fourth, it's just much more natural. That's the mindset around it, how the invitation happens. But then there are some proactive things that you can do. First, you can prepare for the podcast interview in a way that you listen to previous podcast episodes, that you learn what are the angles that the host wants to discuss on their show. You prepare your introduction, you prepare some of your talking points, and as a result, you will join the conversation much more confident, much more prepared, and you will deliver better interview compared to if you would really just join and do nothing. A good thing is that this is a lot of these things are You do them once, such as preparing your introduction, practicing it, maybe preparing call to action, some talking points, and then you can use it over and over again during different interviews. Any arguments, any thoughts against that, Tom, or has Jakob hit the nail on the head? Yeah, it's a very measured response. A lot resonates with what we see with our hosts. Got it. I'm also (laughs) seeing great comments here, Stan, in the chat. I provide my guests the run of the show, explaining the format, what the guests expect, and that puts my guests at ease. Yes, Stan. We've had a a comment, a question rather from Jay Lloyd. What kind of database, websites or research should you use when a client comes wanting to start guesting? We use a couple of databases, but you can use listennotes.com. Just search for keywords that are the most relevant to your industry. So if you're in B2B marketing, search for B2B marketing in quotes and it will give you all episodes and podcasts that mention this in the description of their podcast or in the title, and you will be able to find a relevant shows by using this keyword strategy. Nice. Patrick coming in with a comment, both good arguments here. It's, it's looking very close. From what I'm seeing, there's equal blows coming from left, coming from right, coming from hosting, coming from guesting. That website is listennotes.com if you want to check it out. Keep the comments coming in. If we've got any questions that you want to throw to Jakob on Team Guesting, let us know, or any questions for Tom Hunt, on team podcast hosting again let us know or if you host your own podcast or if you guest on a podcast we'd be interested to know the experience that you've had on either way so keep those questions or points coming in the chat box but we've got a question now from Jakob to Tom yes so Tom being a podcast host is hard not everyone is interesting enough to be host or maybe they don't have that spark that makes podcasts like Joe Rogan super successful so how do you actually support someone who is struggling with hosting, but they really want to be podcast hosts. Yeah, so first, you nailed it. Like, you have to pick the right person. Often we have a client, like a business, who's planning to do a podcast, and then we would advise and support them in choosing the right person because some can be taught and some can't be taught. So let's, but your question specifically was, what if somebody is going to be the host that maybe needs some support? So how do we do that? And how can we improve somebody's hosting skills? A, well, there's two different types of feedback that we can give in order for them to improve. First of which is qualitative. So somebody does the thing, we assess 
and then we give feedback qualitatively on this thing could be different or this thing could be better. Second is quantitative. So we're looking at what percentage of time the host is speaking versus the guest. We typically like to see 20 to 25% host the rest with the guest. And then we can also, with software, track how many filler words this person is using during their interview and then maybe challenge them next time to use the word so a little bit less. So those are the strategies we can use to improve. But really, it's a key part in the success of a show is the skill of the host. And so if somebody is not doing so well at the host, maybe they should be replaced. What makes a good host very quickly? Two things. First of which is industry expertise and enthusiasm. And then number two is communication skills. The first one can, or the industry expertise can be taught. The enthusiasm can't really be taught. The communication skills can be taught up to a point. So those are the criteria we look for a selection of hosts and those are the things we can do to improve the skill of the host. Fair points. Thank you, Tom. We've had a rebuttal from the audience, actually. Patrick Venn in with a, a huge crushing blow. Wouldn't it be better to be a guest? That way, the spotlight or focus is on you, your brand, your story. If you're a host, the spotlight isn't on you. It's on your guest, a thought. I think it's a valid point. Now, well, the kind of key assertion here that Patrick is completely missed is, or the assumption Patrick <laughs> has made here is that podcast that you run is an interview show where you are just spending your time talking about the guest and what the guest does. So two points there. A, that isn't always necessarily the case. Not every episode has to be you talking to the guests about their expertise. And then B, actually what makes a good podcast episode is not the guests talking about what they do or their business, right? It's the guests talking about the thing they're interested in or the interesting thing that they've done, which does build credibility. It doesn't directly drive people, though, to their brand. So... I think the key there is that in order for you to influence an audience to want to buy from you if you have your own show, you do need to share your own expertise, whether that's as you're hosting, you feed in that insight, or you even run solo episodes where you talk about the things that you're learning, your brand and your story. Well, he's thrown in the solo episode rebuttal. Patrick, it'd be interesting <laughs> to know your thoughts. Jakob, what are your thoughts, actually? Can you just do solo episodes instead of guesting? Like, is that not better? Thoughts? Well, solo episodes are definitely becoming a trend specifically for the reason that Patrick mentioned, that all the spotlight is usually on the guest when you are appearing, when you are hosting interview-based shows. It's actually difficult to find balance if you're hosting an interview show to evenly showcase your expertise and not only shine light on the guest. And it is a difficult skill to master so your personality actually shows through the interviews. And there are very few hosts who can do it well. Ooh, some good arguments. I like Stan's comment just in. Your audience seldom remembers what the guests say. They always remember how you make them feel. It's uh, an interesting point. And I guess that could be portrayed either way, right? Like it could be that the host has kind of presented the show very, very well and asked great questions. But likewise, it could be that the guest on it has given some really valuable answers or tactics or strategies, whatever the conversation surrounds. All right, let's move. Tom Hunt to Jakob. So many podcasts, even more guests. How do you make your clients stand out from the crowd? So there are three things. First is it starts with the scheduling experience. So that's basically when the whole standing from the crowd begins. We very often hear from podcast hosts and our guests hear it from podcast hosts that the way it, we represent them actually puts them in really better position to be then interviewed. So it starts with the outreach. Then it's thorough preparation. So just making sure that the guest is actually prepared. So we tell all our customers to listen to a podcast before their guests, or maybe on double speed, you know, listen to one episode to really give you a good idea of the show that you are about to appear on. We hear again from podcast hosts that if guests do it, then the episode is much better because they know what to expect from the format. And lastly, the promotion. So the, most podcast guests don't do a really good job promoting the episode. So we actually pay a lot of attention to our customers promoting the episode. And we also help them to create some content from it and so on. So those are the three main things. Scheduling experience, preparation, and promotion. Got it. We're going to go straight to the next one to keep time running smoothly. 
We've got a question from Jakob to Tom. So Tom, there are millions of podcasts. Why are your podcasts different? Goes back to the positioning process. Step one, what is the niche? And can we go as narrow as we possibly can while still making a show that's going to build an audience that could be profitable for us? So the example I'd love to give is if we have a SaaS business that we're running and we sell email marketing software, are we going to A, start a podcast about marketing, B, start a podcast about email marketing, or C, start a podcast about open rates? Anybody, Sam, Jakob, which one do we think we're going to do? Mm, open rates. Nailed it. Nailed it. The reason for that is it's going to be very easy to become the best email marketing open rates podcast within six months. Once we have that dedicated audience, we can expand to email marketing and then maybe even after that, expand to marketing later down the road. So that's step one, is being sufficiently narrow with our niche. Step two is what is the edge? What is the thing that our listeners are going to tell our friends about? So going back to that example, maybe we have proprietary data that our SaaS tool is sharing with us. Maybe we see email marketing open rates trends over the past three years aggregated across all users. We can feed those stats into the episode to drive questions or to drive discussions. What that is going to do is it makes our podcast different and better from other people that or from other people that have shows about email marketing open rates, which is that extra value for the listener, which is going to help us grow. And then the sneaky thing there is that we're able to also advertise our product without advertising our products because obviously these metrics are coming from the product. So those are the two steps. First, get the niche or niche sufficiently narrow. And then two is craft a compelling edge. Love it. Thank you. This man is loving the niche and niche angle, but we'll, we'll see what the audience think at the end. And we've got a question from Tom Hunt to Jakob. You, your client is unhappy. How would you address this? So I will go through this quickly, just going of time. So it usually comes down to two things, why they're unhappy. First, lack of measurable results. So for example, leads or lack of bookings. So when it comes to specifically about measurable results, it starts with setting the expectation and actually repeating that it takes a while before the episodes get published, get recorded even, and then, you know, promote it through social media. So it takes some time after, you know, you book an interview to see some traction. So it's usually a question of we need to wait a little bit longer. And when it comes to lack of bookings, so there's usually a mismatch between the audience that we are reaching out to, so the podcast that we are pitching, and the topics that we are suggesting. So we need to uncover where's the issue. So for example, we look at reply rates, if it's under our benchmark, we look at the emails we are sending, what are the angles that we are proposing, if the podcast we are reaching out to are correct. And then we basically make an informed decision how we need to change the approach. So we start seeing uptake in the reply rates and we start receiving more bookings. So that's a very high level answer. <laughs> Getting that reviewing, auditing and fine tuning. Another question for Jakob to Mr. Tom Hunt. I'm you produce excited. an episode, but the client struggles with promotion. What do you do? So we technically run promotion. So, but if we weren't and the client was, if we were producing and then the client was promoting, what would we do? We believe at Fame that retention is the foundation of growth. And so actually, if we're struggling with promotion and the caveat is we have the positioning right, as we were just discussing, then actually it probably isn't a promotion problem. It's probably a production problem. If we're not having people giving us five-star reviews, giving quality feedback to our host that they're enjoying the episode, then we're probably not producing content that people actually like. And so we wouldn't necessarily tweak much on promotion. We go back tweaking the conversion of the raw assets into the final edited audio. And then over time, we'd be looking for the Apple podcast consumption rate. So the average amount of people, so the average amount of an episode people are listening to on Apple, because that's the only directory that will give us that. We want to see that going up before we then go and do any more work on promotion. So fixing the product before you bring more eyeballs to the product. Exactly. Makes sense. There we go. The lightning round. We move on from the Q&A. So we've got a uh, scenario one is a client wants to generate leads as soon as they possibly can. What do you put into place? Tom Hunt first. So assuming we already have a podcast, it's a very simple step. You script the ad, which is just literally going to be 30 seconds, the client explaining what their business does and the problem it solves. They record it. We then insert that ad into every episode in the backlog of their existing podcast. It goes live in five minutes and we're immediately getting exposure for that ad to generate leads. 
So for me, you appear on the podcast, you go through the previous podcast episodes uh, of the show that you just appeared on, you see what are those interesting people you like to get introduced to, you deliver an amazing podcast episode on the show that you got invited on, and you build a relationship with the host, and then you kindly ask if it's possible to make an introduction to some people who are interesting from the previous guests. That is a nice strategy. I've actually never thought of that. So <laughs> shout out to Jakob for that one. Scenario two, let us keep us keep your thoughts coming in the chat box if you've got any opposing angles. Scenario two, the audience your client wants to reach is very narrow, very slim. What is your approach, Jakob, to fight first? So first I would look at their topics, what they want to talk about, and then basically test whether we can propose these topics to different audiences as well. Of course, we need to get the green light on this from the customer too. If this wouldn't work, we really need to think about broadening the audience entirely so it still supports their business. It is a difficult conversation to manage. And sometimes we actually needed to turn down customers because their audience was just too narrow. And in that case, we actually send them to podcast production agencies because it's better if you just are operating in very, very small niche. So some conversations need to be had around if this happens in a live campaign. <laughs> so our approach, we're, li we're literally like rubbing our hands together. This is like perfect. It basically means we're going to become the number one podcast in this very specific niche, like right away. Now, obviously, there also has to be a conversation because if the niche is too narrow and there's just no way we're going to find guests or listeners or a sufficient amount of guests or listeners for this to be a profitable content marketing campaign for the client, then we probably at that stage would advise to broaden the niche slightly, assuming that that broader niche would still be relevant for people buying their product. There we go. We move on to scenario three. The guests or podcasts you reach out to are not replying. There's a very, very roaringly low reply rate. How do we tweak our approach? Tom. So I've reached out to probably hundreds of podcasts to try and be a guest on. I've also reached out to, it must be close to thousands of people trying to get them to be a guest on podcasts. The number one thing that improves reply rates is just social proof. So if you're starting your own podcast and you're finding guests, go to your network, find someone that's a big name. If you don't, the process is going to be much slower. Book that guest. In the next set of outreach you do, mention that guest name and you just keep going and you keep climbing the ladder. I'm on episode 97 of Confessions of a B2 Marketer, a little shout out there. And... It's only in the last 20 or 30 guests where we've had these massive names, but I've only been able to get those big names because I've been climbing the ladder slowly and slowly and just leveraging that social proof. All right. My answer to this, it usually comes down to that we are reaching out to podcasts that are not entirely relevant to the guests that we are trying to reach, that we are trying to book on these podcasts. So we really need to look into the research first. Are these podcasts relevant for this guest? If the answer is yes, then we look into the outreach and just make sure that the emails we are sending are correct. That means we are leading with relevancy. So in the first paragraph, we mention why this guest is relevant. So what's in it for the host? And then we lead with credibility because hosts don't really care if you are Forbes 30 under 30, if you have nothing to do with the topic of their podcast. There we go. Scenario for the marketing team has a very clear strategy and well-defined messaging. How the heck do we ensure that podcasting fits into this? You've got Jakob first. So again, it starts with setting expectations correctly because podcasting, it's not like producing a press release. You will never be fully in charge of where the direction of the interview will go. The host is actually running the podcast. So once this is understood within the team, we need to invite you know the broader marketing people into the conversation and just align on what are the strategic objectives for the next six to 12 months to align topics around that. And based on that, we are usually good to go. We need to set some maybe constraints, what to talk about, what could be talked about, what shouldn't be talked about on these shows. But podcasts are usually well receptive when we mention these small requirements. And Tom? As I've said multiple times, positioning is key for the success of the start of a podcast. What do we need for positioning? We need a narrow niche and we need an edge. To answer this question, if the marketing team has a clear strategy and well-defined messaging, that usually gives us the fuel we need to define the edge of the show. Let's say the marketing team have defined a unconventional belief that the business has about the market. That can normally be weaved within to the edge of the show, into the description of the show, even the name of the show, into the questions we ask 
on the show. And so typically marketing teams absolutely love it when they hand over their strategy documents to us. And then we're like, okay, we'll take that and this will form that part of the show. So it's really the simple exercise of taking what the marketing team has and then feeding that into the positioning process for the podcast. There we go. And scenario five, podcasting is a content goldmine How do you squeeze the most content out each and every episode? Tom, to go first. So everyone knows the four different types of content you can create from a video recording, right? We've got the audio, which is typically distributed to Apple Podcasts. We have the full-length video, that's video snippets, that's YouTube. We have text on LinkedIn, working very well now for B2B. And then we also have image that can also be used on any social platform. So that's like very basic stuff. We break it down into those four formats and we distribute. What gets more interesting is like the macro content we can produce. Let's say we're asking every question for like a data point. It's like a cybersecurity podcast and we're asking for a data point on cybersecurity. After 50 episodes, we have a unique database of cybersecurity data points that we can put into a Google Sheet and then give that away as a lead magnet. And so I would say the key here is just understanding the kind of micro distribution with the content that we can make through those four channels, but then also over time, when you're building this unique proprietary database of content that no one else has that you own, you can create these macro assets. So I wouldn't be repeating what you just said, well, like with the formats that you can repurpose each interview into, because you can do pretty much the same with interviews as where you are as a guest. You cannot do the data points, but what you can do is that you can actually use your podcast interview as a sales follow-up during the sales process. We've seen that this works so well because it elevates your credibility as a person who is trying to sell something to your prospect. And it is a nice touch and it usually helps a lot your sales staff to if they have some ammunition they can use during the follow-up process and interviews of you speaking on other people's podcasts. We've seen that it carries a lot of weight and adds a lot of credibility to the seller. There we go. Some big fighting talk from both rounds. Now we've got the audience up again. We want question and answers. Any questions that you've got as the audience, everyone tuning in, is there anything we've not covered? Patrick's just said something interesting, business focused on building brand, creating big content engine. So Patrick's actually said that if you run a business, then you should host a podcast. But if you're a freelance or solopreneur, then you should guest on podcasts. Jakob or Tom, any thoughts? On the fence, on the fence, Patrick. I would say, why would I say that if you are, I guess I am admitting that one potential downside of running your own show is it is more time and resource heavy. And therefore, that's maybe one reason why I would agree with Patrick here is that businesses would typically have more resources than a, a freelancer or a solopreneur. Yep, that is the case. We work with both target, we basically board both groups, big B2B businesses and individuals as well. And it's true, we've seen more individuals basically working with us for years because they have the right mindset. They don't need to resell every quarter why we are doing this to people above. So there are very few B2B companies who actually understand the value of appearing on podcasts. So yeah, both groups work, really. So you, quick, quick question, are you saying, uh, maybe I'm derailing a conversation, do you have a higher LTV with the freelancers or solopreneurs, like they last for longer? We transitioned into B2B SaaS maybe like a year and a half or two years ago, but we still have some people from basically the first year working with us. So okay. yes, we are seeing bigger trend with consultants and solopreneurs renewing, but it's not significant, you know, B2B brands renew as well. Nice. I'll challenge you both whilst we wait for some more comments from the audience. What is, this goes to both of you, what is the biggest downside of your arguments or hosting or guesting, but what is the very best upside? And you have to answer both honestly as you can. Hmm. I would say upside of owning a show is that you're building your own audience. As I said at the start of this call, B2B businesses, their own audience are going to win. If they don't, they're not going to be able to sell anything. That's the upside. The downside, I would say, is probably... I would say maybe running your own podcast versus running a guesting campaign, it's maybe double or maybe even triple total resources, so time and money to do it properly. So that would be my response. The biggest downside of podcast guesting is that you're right. Like that's the opposite of podcast hosting. You are not building your own channel. Like you are leveraging other people's stages. The biggest upside is that you are, well, not, you don't need to invest so much money into this. 
and you're not creating that big responsibility that you need to keep going so it doesn't look bad if you just stop after you know a few episodes. And I would say that potentially, you know, we're saying how like a key thing for when you're running your own show is for the host to be good. It does actually make sense. Like if somebody's considering starting their own show to guest first, learn more about podcasting, get better at talking and presenting. So when you actually come around to launching your own show, maybe you have a little bit of an audience because people know you from the podcast you've been on. But more importantly, you have the skill that you need as a host to make it work. There we go. The fighting talk is rolling. And knockout pitches are incoming, guys. Let's go knockout pitch from Jakob. All right, knockout pitch from me. So if you're here, you probably want a podcasting strategy. And the best way to get started is becoming a guest on other podcasts first. First, you will get a taste of this channel without creating a responsibility of producing your own podcast. Second, it's much more affordable than running your own podcast. You know, our customers pay around £1,000 per month compared to triple or maybe five times that some podcast production agencies can charge. And third, by appearing on relevant podcasts, you will instantly reach hundreds or thousands of your ideal B2B customers. And it's instead of like slowly achieving it through launching your own podcast episode by episode. So if you need a podcasting strategy and you want to reach your ideal customers at scale, podcast guesting is the strategy that you should consider in 2024. Very big fighting talk there. But what is Mr. Tom Hunt on team hosting going to say? There's a reason why HubSpot bought the hustle. There's a reason why Lavender started Lavender Land. It's because these B2B businesses understand something that maybe you don't. And that is that B2B businesses that own their audience will win. With every day that goes past, it's getting harder and harder to build your own audience as more and more people realize this. And so the one knockout punch for the hosting corner is that you are going to have to, as a B2B business, build your own audience. So why not start today? The fighting talk won't stop. We've got some good arguments on either side. So decision time. Who is going to win? Roll up, roll up. You've been listening for the last 60 minutes. What are your thoughts? Are we able to add a poll? I'm a noob on Zoom, so I don't I, know I, I can, can do it. So I will quickly open the poll. So who wins? Ladies, gents, boys and girls, what have you thought? In the meanwhile, let's have hashtag hosting or hashtag guesting. We're about to put a poll in the chat. So get ready to place your vote. Do you think it is Jakob who's been arguing for team guesting on podcasts? Or do you think it is Tom Hunt who's been arguing for team hosts on podcasts? We have got a poll that has just hit. Who wins? Put your thoughts in the poll. (laughs) Tom or Jakob? Let's get the votes flowing in. No, we can't vote. Hosts and panelists can't vote. Oh, no, we can't. I've been on one before where you could. You wanted a word for me, right? I actually was... <laughs> you finally well, understood it. <laughs> what have we got here? We've got Chad on team hosting, Eddie on team hosting, Irene on team guesting, Rhea on team guesting. Very even so far. Ash has enjoyed the chat. Michael's on team guesting, Patrick hosting, Megan hosting, Erlo hosting, Ash hosting. Tom's ghosting, Tracy's guesting. <laughs> Might be a slight edge on hosting, but I'm sure plenty of people have voted who've perhaps not put in the chat yet. So make sure you keep your votes coming. So we Love have 19 some... out of 30 participants voted in the poll. So please, there should be a poll on your screen. So just click Tom Hunt for hosting or myself for... Thanks, host. Marty, for joining. <laughs> Thank for you, Marty. Chat. Thanks a lot for, for joining. Yeah, some great questions have been coming in. Really enjoyed the audience participation. So thanks for sharing everyone about your thoughts on podcast guesting, hosting. Not listening. <laughs> well then, Chad, hashtag listening nice. <laughs> so I do think, well, so two, two very final points. A, I do think it's very good to possibly start guesting before you start your own show. But the other thing I'll say is it's also great to guest when you do have your own show because obviously That's the true. people on those podcasts like podcasts. They're interested mm-hmm. in the topic. So it's actually a great way to promote your own show. So shout out to guesting. <laughs> and shout out to hosting you know without hosting we wouldn't be in business so thanks a lot for <laughs> doing this <laughs> these guys are too nice I thought it was a fight but they've come out friends thanks for right. you the other Eddie <laughs> <laughs> thanks HP thanks Amelia appreciate you tuning in alright so it looks like Tom won Tom is Victoria no 14 yeah <laughs> there we go Tom have you got any final words as I said like guesting if you want to start a show, I'd guess first. And then when you do have your show, I'd also guess I do it. So shout out to guessing. Awesome. Great stuff. Great stuff.
All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. This was great. Great stuff, guys. Good battle. Congrats on the win, Tom. Great fight, Jakob. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you very much. Yeah, team. Bye-bye.